Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. And don't forget to go and get yourself that fizzy effervescent drink or something lovely and warm to drink because I've got a lovely story for you tonight. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Growing up as a little girl in the 1940s, there was no love lost between me and my small family. My father inadvertently blamed me for the abrupt, impetuous, unheralded death of my beloved, very precious mother, although he would never say a thing to me about his true feelings when he was sober. As my father was by nature a soft, gentle, generous spirit, not inclined to be hard-hearted or cold by nature. It would seem in the cold, brutal light of day. He treated me very differently to my older sister, on whom he graciously showered with an abundance of love. My mother had died during childbirth, which was less uncommon in those days as it is now. At the time, he had obsequiously begged the doctors to save my mother's life over her baby, which was me. But despite the doctor's very best efforts to accommodate his wishes, in the end, I was the one that was unfortunately spared for him. Sometimes, despite our very best wishes, serendipity can play a role in our lives, and it was not meant to be for my mother. When my father was drunk, he would hurl abuse at me. He didn't mean to, because he wasn't a mean man, but his seemingly unmerciful life had been unfairly discriminatory on him as he had loved my mother so dearly. So my presence in his life was embittered, an acrid reminder of his dreadful calamitous loss. Let's just say my sister, who was eighteen when my mother died, would also be quick to blame me for my mother's gratuitous absence in our lives. Let's just say her cutting intransigent words were really piercing, as she doggedly, obstinately perceived, I was the one who stole her mother away from them by daring to be born, and causing my mother to lose so much blood in the process that it was almost impossible for her to be saved. My sister would say to me, You're a murderer! You killed mummy! And the guilt of what I'd done weighed so heavily on my young heart. I knew I had to be a very bad person. My sister would tell me how wonderful my mother had been in life. So kind, so beautiful, so noble, so devoted. She'd show me unblemished, pristine pictures of this beautiful, graceful-looking woman, with long, strawberry-blonde hair and bright, sparkling blue eyes, who looked almost celestial, like an angel. I'd see her pictures and leather-bound albums of the three of them together, looking every part the happy family. It would grieve my heart that I'd woefully managed to tear them apart. I knew that I was like that unsightly mole that pops out on your skin unexpectedly that no one wants and would like very much to cut out. I could see a sparkle in my father's eyes back then in those old photographs that no longer existed today. It was as if that joyful look and my father's heart belonged back to a time when life had been graciously good to him. Not any more. I wanted more than anything in the world for my father to be happy, like he was in those photographs, because I loved him with all my heart and I was the reason my dad would bask in his melaconia. I never saw him smile, not once, and I knew, I knew with every part of my being, that this was because of me, and that made me feel very sad indeed. Mummy and Daddy never wanted you, my sister would say. They discussed the fact that they didn't want to have any more children. They didn't plan for you, like they planned for me. I was an only child. When you were born, I was 18 years old. They didn't want any more children. It was three of us against the world. Until you came along. You were a mistake. A faux poids, that's what they say. When Mum was pregnant with you, she cried ruefully for days and days on end. I remember her saying that she wished with all her heart she wasn't pregnant. She didn't want any more children. But no, no, you were audaciously determined to come along, come what may, and ruin everything for us. 
And now she's dead because of you. And Dad is always sad. If my father overheard my sister talking to me like that, with such an obvious heartless disdain, he would chastise her. There's no need to talk to your sister Meredith like that, he would say. Your mother's death was a tragic accident. It couldn't be helped. But his eyes told a very different story and failed to disguise the deep pain he felt within his heart. And despite his very best efforts, I knew under the layers, deep down in his gut, he also clandestinely blamed me for her fortuitous death. And I mean, how could I blame him for that? Even at eight years old, he couldn't hide that look from me. It's amazing how discerningly perceptive you can be when you're young. My sister said my dad used to have black hair, the colour of coal. But in the week of my birth, due to his lugubrious wounded heart, his hair turned grey. My father had three prominent eyebrows, one that was on top of his mouth, and the other that framed both of his eyes like a hairy curtain rail. My father's eyes were as blue as the ocean. I loved his eyes, because if they were water, you could swim in them. I hasten to say that there were good times in those early days, in our Tennessee mountain home. Even hurting people have their endearing moments, you know, when they're actually kind and loving. I was to learn later on in life, hurting people hurt people, and my father was angry with the universe, with God, and of course with me, for we had all played our quintessential roles of depriving him of the love of his life. When my father would drink alcohol, that was when he would say those mean things to me, so I didn't like it when he drank, because the drink made him become horrible. But when he was sober, he was so incredibly kind. My sister was quick to point out that when my father was drunk, his true feelings would emerge, like the white smoke from a chimney. Go to bed, you little runt, my father would draw. You are nothing but a waste of space. If you hadn't been born, I'd have my wife here with me. I wouldn't need to drink like this. Drown my sorrows. You make me drink so that I don't have to feel this dreadful pain. Every time I look at you, I'm reminded of what you've done. Now get out of my sight. I would burst into tears and run up to bed, saturating and soaking my pillows with the downpour of my remorseful regret. If I had been a cloud, I would have rained on the earth an awful lot, but at least the plants would have benefited from my weeping. My sister would say accusingly to me, Now look what you've done. You've made Daddy upset. That's why he's drinking. It never occurred to her that I was also upset, but then it would seem my hurt didn't matter to her at all. She was fiercely protective towards my father, which was why she had never left home in the first place. She ran our household, cleaned and cooked, and took care of everything. And I will admit, she really was a domestic goddess in every regard. The kind of woman men would dream to have as a wife. I knew if she left home that my father would never manage without her. But by the looks of my sister, she was like a stubborn piece of heavy-duty furniture that had no intentions of going anywhere. Not any time soon, that is. There were times, many of them, that my sister Felicia was very kind to me, gentle, warm-hearted, companionable, and affectionate, telling me how much she loved having me as a sister, when she'd faithfully brush my hair over a hundred times and attentively braid it on both sides of my head. She would help me get dressed in those early days, making sure I looked my absolute best especially on Sundays, and solicitously give me things to do around the house that would make me feel terribly important, like polishing the dresser or helping her bake some chocolate chip cookies that were my daddy's absolute favourite. Sometimes I would walk with her hand in hand to the local town, where she'd buy me ten cents worth of sweets, and if I was very good, a nice ice cream that cost seven cents. I would always choose vanilla ice cream dipped in chocolate. So despite everything, my life was remarkably good, but I always grew up with a profound sense that my father and sister would be a great deal happier without me. I knew I was the blight on the landscape that always reminded them of the biggest nightmare in their lives, the loss of my beloved mother that occurred because of a monumental mistake, and that grievous mistake was me.
My sister explained to me that some mistakes could never ever be undone. It's not like dropping stitches when you knit, she told me. Mummy's dead. She's never coming back. She's in heaven now. She's otherwise engaged. Is it nice in heaven? I asked her. Very nice in heaven, she told me. The roads there are paved with gold. There are flowers that sing songs for you. And they're dancing rainbows in the sky made out of colours you can't even get here on earth. And God sits there on a golden throne, welcoming everyone into heaven when they arrive. He looks exactly like Father Christmas with lots and lots of white hair and a bushy beard. And he's a very loving, clever, clever man. Older than the world. And he knows all his children very well by name. And he has thousands and thousands of children, as many as the stars that you can see in the sky. And when we go to heaven, our clothes become as bright as those stars. And we never ever get sad there, because there are no tears there, no sadness, no sorrow. There's joy in heaven, and trees dripping with the sweetest fruit you've ever tasted in your life. Well then, why don't we go there to be with Mummy, and then we can be very happy together. It sounds such a nice place. It's not like that, silly. You can't just go there when you want to. You have to wait for God to call you first. He has to invite you over. It's like when you get an invitation to a birthday party. You can't go unless they send you an invitation. Do you understand? I remember thinking God was being selective and very mean, not sending us a personal private invitation to heaven and willfully excluding us, just like Alicia Winterbourne, who had refused to send me any invitations to her birthday party because she said I copied her picture in art because my picture had two rainbows, not just one, and so did her picture. But I knew that she had sneakily copied my picture, not the other way round. One night, when I was fast asleep in bed, I suddenly woke up to hear my father and sister downstairs talking in the kitchen together. I could hear the mumbling and muttering, as if they were deliberately trying to talk quietly together, and wondered to myself why they were up so late. I would have normally pulled the bed cover over my head and continued to sleep, but I promptly decided I was thirsty and needed some milk to quench my thirst, so I crept soundlessly down the staircase, but that was when I heard my name being mentioned. I stood very still, listening in to the conversation intently, my ears perked forward like a dog. I sat on the staircase in my pink pyjamas, wrapping my little arms around my legs close to my chest to eavesdrop on what they were actually saying. I could tell by the solemn, sombre tones of their voices that what they were discussing was very serious indeed. I wondered in clandestine horror if something quite dreadful had happened. They talked in the same heavyweight, grave kind of voices when Granny Mona had died. I listened carefully, and then I realised that they're discussing me. My sister told me it was bad to talk about people behind their backs. She called it gossiping, but she was gossiping about me to my father, so she was doing the same thing she deemed ugly, and I felt disappointed in her for that. Dad, you know it makes sense. I've seen how sad you've been since Mum died. I am too, you know, and I know every time you look at Meredith, you're reminded of what happened. It's been eight years, Dad, and the pain still doesn't go away, does it? If anything, it's worse now than ever before. I believe Meredith is entirely responsible for our pain, Dad. When Mum was alive, I will remind you that you didn't drink a drop of alcohol. Never. You never touched the stuff. Mum would be so upset, so disappointed to see you like this, Dad. Caught up in such grievous despair. And drinking too much just to drown your sorrows. These days, Dad, you never ever smile. I don't think I've seen you laugh once. It breaks my heart, Dad, to see you like this. It really does. You deserve so much better. You deserve to be happy. I know I shouldn't blame that poor child for the disjointed meliconia, I feel. I mean, it's hardly her fault, is it, for what transpired that dreadful night. But I can't help blaming her, resenting her for everything. I know I'm being unreasonably selfish. But I can't help feeling 
that if she had not been born, none of this would ever have happened, and we would be very happy as we always were together. I know I treat her differently to you. I wish I didn't. I feel very guilty for how hard I can be on her at times. I don't give her all the affection she deserves. I mean, she's only eight years old, for goodness sake, and I'm a grown man. I should know better. It's like I'm picking on her for no reason at all. But I can't help how I feel. Sometimes I even hate her when I look at her. I'm constantly reminded over and over again about your beautiful, precious mother. How I miss her. I feel aggrieved, so aggrieved with what happened to her. It was all bitterly unfair. And I'm sorry, but God is also responsible for all this. He said in his word we wouldn't have to put up with more than we can bear. But he lied. He lied to me about that. How can I respect the good Lord when he does that? I ask you. My life is torturous without my beloved Christine. And I'll never, ever be the same again. I thought with time I would come to terms with things, move on with my life, even get remarried at some point. But I can't let go of the hurt. I can't let go of Christine. It's all consuming. It really is. I feel exactly the same way, Dad. I promise you that. When I look at Meredith, I think of Mummy. And then I feel such indignant anger towards her. I know people would be disgusted if they saw the way we act sometimes. The way we behave towards Meredith, they'd think we were being irrational in our judgment. And they would have a good point about that. I mean, if I was wearing their shoes, I'd feel exactly the same way. But it's so easy to pass judgment, isn't it? When you're looking from the outside in. They haven't been through the mince grinder like we have. I admit, we probably are being unreasonable. We should love her, like we loved Mum. But it's so much easier said than done. That's why, Dad, we've got to do this. Do you understand? We've got to do this. This way we can both heal and move on with our lives. And I think it's in Merilda's best interest as well. I mean, you do want her to be happy, don't you, Dad? Of course I do, Felicia. Of course I do. I want very much for her to be happy. More than anything in the world. Every parent wants the best for their children. I'm no different. That's why I feel like such a pig favouring you over her. But with you I have so many precious memories spent with your mother. The three of us together as one loving happy family. And when Meredith came along... It was a full stop to that life, the life I'd always known and loved. Despite everything, I do love her, but I can't seem to show her that. I seem incapable of overcoming my bitterness. I understand, Dad. I really do get it. I feel exactly the same way. I was telling you that Mr and Mrs Araminta both lost their daughter, same age as Meredith. Very similar looks to Meredith too, strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. The little girl drowned in their pond. They're absolutely devastated. Mrs. Araminta cannot have any children of her own. They've been trying for years and years and nothing has happened. The doctors don't know why she's barren, but it appears she is. Let's just say, Dad, giving Meredith to her as a daughter wouldn't be a formal adoption. It would be an arrangement between us. It would mean that if we wanted to go and visit Meredith, we could, but at least they'd have a child to replace the one they lost, and we would be able to move on with our lives and begin to heal. It's a win-win situation all around, don't you see? You can be assured the Araminters will show her love, lots of it, and Meredith will get the life she really deserves. It's not fair, Dad, the way we treat her. She deserves better. You do show favouritism to me. And it's not right. The Araminters are much wealthier than we are, so I'm sure Meredith will have landed in the clover. She'll have lovely things, and what little girl doesn't appreciate a bit of finery? I've seen the way Meredith looks at those princess clothes in that lovely boutique in town that we could never afford to buy for her. But the Araminters will give her the life of her dreams, 
They'll be able to serenade her with all this extravagant stuff. She'll have privilege, advantage, and a great education. They'll probably send her to a very expensive school. You're right. Perhaps this is the answer, and Meredith will be able to make another couple happy. It can't have been easy for them losing a child, as it has not been easy for us losing your mother. Maybe this is a very good decision. It won't be easy for us to let go of your sister, but I think you're right in the long term. It is in our best interests, and of course it's in Meredith's best interest as well. I remember sitting on the staircase, tears spilling down my cheeks. I could taste the saltiness on my tongue. They were like unwelcome raindrops on a fine sunny day. My father and my sister wanted to get rid of me. Not only did they blame me for my mother's unforeseen death, but they couldn't bear to have me around a moment longer as part of the family. I had come along not only at an inopportune time in their lives, but I had stolen the crown jewel from them, my mother. She was the goose that laid the golden egg. How I wish I had not been responsible for killing her. If she had died some other way, then I wouldn't be blamed for her unpremeditated passing. And maybe then, just maybe then, my father might actually love me. I was eight years old when Mrs. Araminta came to pick me up at my home, in her black book roadmaster. My sister and father told me I was going to live with a lovely couple for a while, but I knew that they were secretly offloading me onto someone else, as they did not want me any more. Both my father and my sister were fighting back tears when they watched me climbing back into the back of the truck, with all my worldly goods packed in one small suitcase. I felt so sorrowful, so sad, so deflated, like an abandoned stray dog on the side of the road that nobody wanted to own. My heart was heavy, but I wondered why my family appeared sad to see me go, because they so desperately wanted to get rid of me, didn't they? So the streaming tears down their faces were incongruous and made no sense to me whatsoever. Meredith, I want you to be so happy, my sister had told me. I want you to have the most perfect life. If things don't work out for you, you can always come back home. But I'm sure you're going to be incredibly happy in your new home. Mr and Mrs Araminta have much more money than we have, and they can give you a much, much better, much more privileged life. You'll go to better schools, you'll have better things. I know I've sometimes snapped at you, Meredith, blamed you for what happened to Mum, and that wasn't fair. And I really apologise profusely for that. I know it wasn't your fault, really. It's just the festering wounds I feel about Mother's loss are very deep. And it's far worse for Daddy. It doesn't help that with your strawberry blonde hair and your blue eyes, you're the splitting image of Mum. So every time Dad sees you, he sees her. And it makes him very angry at times. More with God than with you, of course. When he looks at you, he keeps being reminded of his dreadful loss. So it would be a lot better if you go. Then me and Daddy will feel much better. You want us to feel better, don't you? You want us to feel better about things. I nodded. I do want you to feel better. But I don't want to go. I want to stay with you and Daddy. My father had taken me into his arms, his eyes filling with tears. He had kissed me gently on the forehead and said, I'm sorry, little Meredith. One day you'll thank me for this. We both want you to be happy, that's all. Mrs. Araminta dutifully led me to the back of her truck, putting me in the passenger seat next to hers. I think in the circumstances you've done the right thing, she told my father. You know grief can do dreadfully strange things. Believe me, I know. You're helping me and my husband an awful lot get through this dreadful pain of ours. And I hope in turn we're helping you in some way. It's so much better not to get lawyers involved. It's a perfect arrangement between us, and I assure you, we will make your daughter very happy indeed. She won't want for a single thing. I can promise you that. I remember the day I arrived at the Araminta's farmhouse. I was amazed by how much more impressive it was compared to my little rustic, simplistic mountain home. But despite its grandeur, I hankered after what I knew what I loved and missed, the simplistic lifestyle of my home. Despite everything, I missed my father and my sister, and wished with all my heart that they had loved me enough to keep me. 
I didn't fancy moving into the strange house with strangers who were grieving the loss of their daughter and were hoping that I would fill her shoes and iron away their pain like a heavy-duty steam iron, working through the ponderously stout creases in an obstinate garment that is refusing to straighten. Let's just say that this is a heavyweight kind of responsibility to put on an eight-year-old girl. The house was nestled against a backdrop of huge mountains that billowed up gracefully into the sky in an undulating sweep of rugged contours that kissed the white cotton candy clouds with their pointed tips. Beyond the pristinely manicured lawn, framed by a small box hedge, there was a flowery meadow that was dappled with occasional rocky outcrops, and beyond that were vast areas of woodland, where towering oaks and red maple trees gracefully imposed themselves on the landscape like lofty giants. The prepossessing red-bricked home, six times the size of our house, very elegantly built, it had high ceilings and large fireplaces, oak wood floors and sweeping staircases, with large windows that overlooked the arresting views of the countryside. It really was a magnificently beautiful home. Of that I cannot dispute. Within days of moving in, I was very uncomfortable in my new environment. Granted, it was thrilling to have a bedroom all of my own, that had been superbly decorated, with no expense spared. The fabulous curtains and duvet covers were wearing a meadow. The walls were luxuriously papered in pink and covered in fairies. The furniture was white wood. The bed was shaped like a princess carriage with large wheels and a white wrought iron canopy. There was a large white shelf on one end of the bedroom covered in a marvellous selection of china dolls wearing opulent elegant gowns antique teddy bears, and there was a huge selection of children's books to choose from. I was thrilled to be the owner of so many fabulous prestigious toys, many with labels from Hamleys in London. Growing up I only had a rather bedraggled rag doll that looked more like something the cat dragged in, but to be fair it had belonged to my sister once, and so had definitely seen better days. When I arrived at the house, Mrs. Araminta threw my suitcase and the clothes I was wearing into the dustbin and described them as pitiful rags. Oh dear, oh dear, these clothes are quite dreadful. They really are. I don't care how little money you have. No little girl should have to dress like this. It's shameful, truly shameful, she said, crying crocodile tears. Well, it looked like that anyway. They belong to my sister when she was my age. I explained. Well, that explains an awful lot then, doesn't it? Why they're so bedraggled. No child of mine is going to wear second-hand cast-offs. That's not going to happen. We have higher standards in this household. It was funny that she'd said that, as I ended up inheriting all her daughter's second-hand clothes and toys, but then to be fair, they all looked as if they were brand new and had been made to measure by an expensive designer or bought from a very expensive toy store. It's cause you're rich, I explained to her. My daddy's not rich like you, I said feeling the urgent need to defend my father, as despite all his failings, I knew he'd never have begrudged us anything he could afford, but my papa had never had the kind of money that the Araminters obviously had. I just felt she was being mean about my poor papa, who worked very hard to secure a living for us. My dad was a brilliant carpenter, and back then such a skill was not appreciated as much as it is now, so the pay he received was rather pitiful. Mrs. Araminta insisted I wore her dead daughter's clothes, which felt weird to me, as even at eight years old, I didn't want to wear a dead person's clothes. I will admit the clothes were fit for a princess, as they were very pretty, with a pink trim and jackets made from fake pink fur, and when I looked at myself in the mirror, I knew I looked like a princess, and very pretty, for I liked the girl staring back at me, even if her eyes looked really rather sad. She looks just like our Charlotte. The resemblance is remarkable. It's uncanny. I mean, the same strawberry blonde hair, the same sparkling blue eyes. I could hear Mr. Araminta say to his wife, You did very well, sweetheart. But are you sure we can keep her as our very own? The way he was talking, you'd think I was a possession he'd purchased like another car for his garage or a pitchfork for his yard shed. What did the family have to say about that? She's ours for good. 
They know she deserves a good life. But the mother died in childbirth delivering her into the world. They wanted to save the mother, but the doctors couldn't. Only the child survived. The mother did not. Let's just say it's most unfortunate, but the husband blames the little girl for the wife's fortuitous death. So it's a catch-22 situation, you could say. They think if she's out of sight and out of mind, the little girl, that is, that they might be able to heal. Their emotions are raw like owls. Eight years on, though. It's too dreadful for words, but it is what it is. Well, their loss is our very fortunate gain. She looks just like our daughter. That's a huge plus. But I doubt she's going to be the same as Charlotte. I want you to realise that, sweetheart. I don't want you to be disappointed. She's likely to have a very different personality, you know. We can make her the same as our daughter, Mrs. Araminta insisted. It won't be too hard. It's like moulding a piece of clay into what you want it to become. It's not too difficult. You wait and see. I'll work miracles on that little girl. I hope you know what you're doing, sweetheart. As I say, I don't want you to be disappointed. I want you to be happy. Mrs. Araminta came into my bedroom. She sat down on my bed next to me to have a chat. She was a woman in her early thirties who wore meadows on her dresses and tiny white belts around her narrow waist. Her dark hair was curly and short, but she also wore pretty jewellery in her hair that glittered like a diamond. She was nice to look at when she had a happy face, but I didn't like it when she wore a sad face or a cross face, then she never looked pretty. When she wore those faces, that is. You're not Meredith any more, she told me. From now on, you're going to be Charlotte. And I want you to call me Mummy. And I want you to call Mr. Araminta Daddy from now on. Do you understand? But my name isn't Charlotte. My name is Meredith. I don't want to be called Charlotte. I like my old name. Not any more. You're Charlotte from now on, says Mrs. Araminta fiercely. This is your bedroom and we are your Mummy and Daddy. Do you understand? Your real Daddy doesn't want you any more. So we are your new parents from now on. Yes, ma'am. No, Charlotte. Not ma'am. What did I say? Yes, mammy. Good girl. Now come down to dinner. I've cooked your favourite. I was stunned because how did Mrs. Araminta know what my favourite meal was? Had she spoken to my sister or my father? I was soon to realise that Mrs. Araminta's daughter, who died, was called Charlotte, and her favourite meal was chicken pot pie. While it was very good and it filled my tummy nicely, it wasn't my favourite meal. I liked buttered scones, gravy and mashed potatoes. But when I told my new mother this, she became indignant. She wore her sad face and piped, Chicken pot pie is your favourite meal, Charlotte, and that's final. Do you understand? I nodded dutifully, but I didn't understand why she was telling me what my favourite food was, as I knew what I liked best. She didn't know what I liked. At night, Mrs. Araminta would read me Charlotte's favourite books and tuck me into bed with Charlotte's teddy bear. You don't want to go to bed without Mr. Scotty, do you? My new mother would say. Mr. Scotty will be offended if you abandon him like this. You know he's your favourite toy. For years, you have not wanted to go to bed without Mr. Scotty. You slept with him since you were three years old. I wanted to protest quite adamantly as I'd never slept with Scotty a day in my life, before I came to live in their home. But I didn't want my new mother to wear her sad face, so I nodded in agreement. In truth, I didn't like Mr. Scotty at all. I thought the teddy bear was absolutely horrid. He wore a tartan jacket with gold buttons down the middle, and had oversized eyes that took up most of his face, that made him look like he was glaring at me. I liked to go to bed with Miranda, the doe. She was pretty with curly black hair and blue eyes. When my mother wasn't looking, I would replace Scotty for Miranda and fling the teddy bear on the floor. On one occasion when my new mother found Mr. Scotty lying in a sorry heap with his face against the floor, underneath a puddle of my dirty clothes, she grabbed the teddy from the floor, her face growing crimson with indignation, her nostrils flaring. She moved towards me and slapped me on the cheek she was so mad. Charlotte, Mr. Scotty is your favourite toy. You're treating him with disrespect and contempt. 
What do you have to say for yourself, leaving him on the floor like this under your clothes? It's not acceptable. It's abysmal behaviour. So there we are. That's the end of part one. Part two is tomorrow night. Until next time, goodbye and good night.